Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and things in my world aren't back to normal by any means, but it does feel like we're getting a little bit of our lives back. If you don't know my saga, my wife was diagnosed with stage 3 cancer in October. She's had four painful surgeries, and she's now getting chemotherapy. And we had our first treatment last week. Chemo is interesting. When you think about cancer, you think about smart doctors, and we have one, Dr. Diamond. But when you go to chemotherapy, you don't see your doctor. You see a bunch of nurses, and they are amazing. But what they aren't are doctors. So they really couldn't answer any of our questions when it came to the medicines and how they worked. We'd be like, why do they mix these two drugs? And the answer we got back from the nurses was because that's what the research says. So we aren't going to learn much about the process with chemotherapy other than the side effects. And the nurses are well versed in what happens with the side effects. So we go into our chemo room, which was nice. We had a private room for our first time and they hooked Ange up. It's pretty much five hours of an IV and then they give us a home IV that stays in for 48 more hours. Then you go back to the hospital and they pull that out of report. The side effects that Ange has had so far are her fingers and toes are hypersensitive to cold. She can't grab anything out of the fridge or it's like needles going into her fingers. There's also nausea and tiredness and that's what I'm seeing so far. And we have medicine for a lot of those things. So it's not really as bad as I thought it would be. But I will say that Ange doesn't feel well by any means. But she's also not glued to the toilet vomiting, which is what I thought would happen based on everything I heard as a kid growing up in the 80s. The one thing I will say about this whole experience is that you really learn who cares about you and who your friends are. People have been reaching out to me from everywhere, and it's so positive and it's almost overwhelming in a good way at times. But go figure, two of my best friends haven't even reached out to see how Ange is doing. I even saw one of them the other day and there was no mention of her. No, hey, how's Ange feeling? Nothing. But whatever. It's really time for me to not cut off these relationships totally, but to pull back from these friendships. And that's my complaining for the week. The good news is that we're on our way to recovery. And while I'm no doctor and I've never heard a percentage from our doctors, I'm confident that we have an 80% chance of beating this thing. And I've mentioned this to a few people, and it's cool to see the optimism in their eyes when I tell them 80%. But remember, sometimes I just say shit, and in this case, I'm lying to make myself feel better. So I say it's an 80% chance that Ange is going to be fine, but I really don't know anything about this because I'm no doctor. I'm a marketer who has a podcast. So don't judge me. Just go along what I say to make myself feel better about our situation, and hopefully everything works out. But that's enough of me telling you about my saga. Now it's time to talk about why you're listening, and I have another great guest this week. Izzy Lynch grew up in Calgary, but her parents got a wild hair up their ass and decided to buy into and build a backcountry ski lodge. So she spent her early days chasing POW, but also chasing gold with ski racing. When racing didn't pan out, Izzy went to school, she found a free ride team to coach, and they encouraged her to compete in the big mountains. And that's part of Izzy's ski story, and we'll get deeper into that through the podcast. But we also talk about part of her life. We talk about marriage, divorce, kids in the mountains, and a lot more. It's a different episode and an awesome episode. And before we get into it, I want to ask you to tell a friend about the show, as it really does help things grow. Also, please subscribe wherever you listen, and most importantly, support my amazing sponsors. I only work with the best, and they are Elon Skis, Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Outdoor Research, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Now, it's time to talk with Izzy Lynch. Early life starts out with mom, dad, brother, and sisters, and it's a normal Calgary life from what I gather, and there's a focus on skiing. Are you guys weekend warriors at Fortress Mountain? Yeah, exactly. We uh, would pack up our big van every Friday and throw our dog in the car and drive out to Fortress Mountain where we would spend the weekend and rally back home on Sunday night. Did the family have a place up there or were you kind of dirtbagging it? What did those weekends look like? We were full on dirtbags. At the time, they had these dorm rooms that I think they were like 15 bucks a night and they had... I think like six bunk beds in them. (laughs) Okay. And so we would all kind of rally in there with a big cooler full of food. And yeah, it was super fun because this whole hallway was filled with dorms and it was just all my parents' best friends and their kids. And so every weekend we would all pile in there and then every meal was just this big potluck. Everyone would just pack tons of food and we'd all meet in the day lodge in the cafeteria that was closed at night and like have these big picnics and kids would run around and parents would 
have a great time. And yeah, it was super fun. That sounds like an amazing way to grow up, at least grow up skiing. But there was also tragedy back at Fortress Mountain back in the day. I don't know if you were there for it, but like 25 years ago, there was a big avalanche that killed like four kids. Did you hear stories of that? Or were you around for that when you were coming up? Yeah, I heard stories of it. So I was a little bit younger than those kids that passed away. They were in high school. They were like a few years ahead of me. But I definitely heard about it. News of it rippled through the, the ski community and at Fortress. And um, yeah, it was super sad. Okay. Your folks, they were both ski racers. And was it something that they were both really talented at? Or was it just something that they did and then they passed it down to you kids? I think they were good at it. I, you know what? That's a good question. I've never actually asked them that. <laughs> were you talented at ski racing? I think they were super passionate. I think my dad spent some time maybe on the Ontario team or the Ontario development team. Yeah, they were known as like uber ski bums, you know, just super passionate, left Ontario to get away from the ice and come out and explore the mountains. They're uber ski bums, but your dad's also an accountant. And while we were going to talk about ski racing, I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk about home building. Because I don't know if your dad has a midlife crisis or whatever's going on in his world or your mom's world as well. But how does your accountant dad and your mom go from a regular life in Calgary to building a remote backcountry lodge? I'd say it's definitely a bit of a midlife crisis situation. <laughs> no, I think more just like fulfilling a lifelong dream of being in the mountains. And their generation, there wasn't as much creativity when it came to designing a career that worked with your lifestyle. And so my dad went to school, he was good at math, he got into accounting, and then you get a job, you get a nine to five in the city and you go to work. And that's just kind of the way it was. So I think that was the mold he felt he had to fit into. But in his heart, he belonged in the mountains, kind of living a more alternative lifestyle, just being more free. So yeah, this was kind of his ticket to experiencing that. What does that all look like? Is it a bunch of those families that are at Fortress? Do they come together and help build this backcountry lodge? Or is it something that he does on his own? How do you guys get into this whole backcountry area? Is there like a tenure that he buys into or how does it work? Yeah, so for my dad's 40th birthday, my mom organized this backcountry ski touring trip for them. And it was the first time they had ever been backcountry skiing. They were also really into whitewater kayaking back okay. in the day. So they had this community of just like hardcore friends that we're into ski touring in the winter and paddling in the summer. And my mom coordinated this adventure for my dad with a friend and his wife. So they rallied up to this remote, tiny little A-frame. Snowmobile got stuck, had a huge epic, like barely made it in there. Got up to this A-frame, woke up in the morning. They're in the middle of this mountain paradise, surrounded by glaciers up in the Alpine. And just had a great week of ski touring. And while they were there on the trip, his friend divulged to him that they had a potential opportunity to buy the tenure that was available there at the time. And my parents had just had the best week of their lives. And they were like, how do we get in? That's how the whole life changes right there? Exactly. Yeah. It was on a whim. Just big, huge yeah, leap of faith. So what happens? Does school end one year and then the whole family gets in the station wagon or the family van, <laughs> heads to a trailhead, then hikes in, creates a camp and then builds a lodge? Exactly. So it was early July because I remember we went to Canmore, which is like an hour east of Calgary. It's kind of the first town in the mountains after you leave Calgary for the Canada Day Parade. And while we were there, there was just all this activity going on. I don't remember my parents ever explaining to me what was happening, but Suddenly we're at a mill getting wood and filling our van with all these supplies and driving further west to Golden and then off the highway up this logging road forever where we met this caravan of people. And my parents were like, yeah, we're going camping for a few weeks. But turns out we were going to build this lodge with this group of people. And it was, yeah, this multi-week work camp where we just had people coming and going. There were like 20 to 25 people there working on the lodge at all times and kids just running wild. I remember my mom and all the other like wives, they built this cook tent out of tarps and they were just cooking the whole time to feed everyone. And it was just like this big, fun work party adventure. So is this something that's going to eventually be a business or is it more like a commune where all those families kind of <laughs> yeah. gathered at Fortress, now they're gathering at your commune out in the woods? 
Yeah. So in order to get a tenure, you have to run a lodge commercially. Like that's kind of the deal with the government. Okay. So yeah, the intent was to run a business. However, no one was relying on the lodge to be kind of their bread and butter. So it allowed them to maintain it also as a place for themselves to go. And there wasn't a ton of stress on booking out every single week of the year and making sure it was totally full. So it was kind of a bit of both. So it was more your weekend and holiday place to go and then they'd rent it out when they could, but it wasn't like a focus to do that. Exactly. And that was before like this big backcountry boom happened where everyone's in the backcountry and every lodge is booked out every week. And so they would advertise that we had these little paper flyers that my mom made. I remember them being super cute. She would take them to the ski shops around the city and book out as many weeks as they can. But we always spent like every school holiday, we were up there for spring break and Christmas and weekends as much as possible. Your dad isn't that versed in the backcountry. It sounds like that 40th birthday party was his first ski touring trip or one of the first few that he does. So when he gets into a backcountry lodge and he's more of a city slicker heading out in the backcountry, is it pretty much like, hey, we're going to figure this out and learn along the way? Yeah, I think there is just a little bit of like ignorance is bliss going on there. Like we were out there and they were like, we know how to ski. Like my parents are really amazing skiers and strong in the mountains and, you know, fit and everything. But I don't know if they were fully aware of the risks they were taking. Right. <laughs> and I think that's also grown over the years just with like so much avalanche education and changes within the ski industry where safety is so at the forefront. And yeah, I think of some of the things we did and I'm just like, oh my God, just crazy. You know, taking little kids on these epically long snowmobile rides in the dark to this remote lodge with no, at that time we didn't have in reaches. We didn't have <laughs> radios. We just went. And I remember the backup plan was, yeah, if something bad happens, we build a snow cave and we just camp out. Or there's a trapper's cabin en route. We can find our way there and we'll hang out there for the night. I mean, was it ever a cause for concern at all? Like when you were that young and you're thinking about it, like what are the most funniest or brutal learning moments that you guys had? Oh, gosh. So at the time, no, like I was just totally unaware. And, you know, as a kid, you completely trust your parents that right. they know what they're doing and you just go along for the ride. But yeah, there was one spring we went up and it was April. I remember it being like Easter break and there was a group coming out of the lodge and you can fly from Golden and that's typically how the guests would get in. But it was expensive to fly in. So we, we had these beater old sleds that we would drive in instead. But there was a group coming out. So there was an opportunity for my dad and my two sisters and I to fly in. And I don't know why this ended up being the plan, but my mom and my 10-year-old brother were going to snowmobile in together alone. Okay. So... It's spring, it's really warm out, and we fly in, and, and they're supposed to show up a couple hours later, and the time is wearing on, and my mom and my brother aren't showing up. I was, I think, 11 or 12 at the time, and I was pretty, like, aware of the time and the day ending, and where's my mom? And so I started asking my dad, like, what's going on? Where's mom? He's, I don't know, she'll be here, you know, if she doesn't make it, she knows what to do, she knows to build a snow cave. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, dad, whatever you say. And we have no radio, no form of communication with them. So like dark falls, bedtime comes, we go to bed and I have two younger sisters. So we're all, we all go to bed and we're all a bit worried about mom and my brother. And sure enough, like I can't sleep. I get up at two in the morning. I can hear my dad kind of like pacing downstairs in the lodge and He's got his ski boots on and I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I have to go find your mother. I guess it just clicked. And he's like, two in the morning is too late. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go get her. So I'm like, okay, I guess I'll stay up here in the middle of nowhere with my two younger sisters with no way of getting a hold of you. <laughs> so he's heading out the door and all of a sudden we see a light, a headlamp coming up the trail towards the lodge. And it's my mom and Dennis, my brother, and they had made it. I guess what had happened was they were coming up the road and you drive along the Blayberry River for like almost 40 kilometers. And then you take this sharp turn across a bridge, across this kind of raging river that comes down from the glaciers. 
and you start going up the switchbacky logging road for 15 kilometers. And my brother really wanted to drive the sled. So he was kind of in front holding onto the handlebars and she was, you know, wrapped around him. And as they're going across the bridge, one of the skis on the sled caught and it pulled them off the bridge into the river. Oh. Yeah. So they're soaking wet. The sled is stuck and probably ruined and all their stuff is wet and their skins are wet and they have very little food because they were just planning on zipping into the lodge and it was like a beautiful day and it was supposed to be easy travel and they somehow attach their skins to their skis and like just start moving and my mom was like yeah I would have built a snow cave and spent the night but we were wet so we would have frozen so she just had to keep my four younger brother, like a 10 year old ski touring up 15 kilometers <laughs> in the dark. And it took them, yeah, 12 hours or something like that. Holy shit. Yeah. I remember her saying my brother was so tired. And so she would let him, you know, lie down on the snow and have a little nap for like 10 minutes at a time. And then she'd wake him up and keep him moving. Oh, geez, that's scary. Yeah, totally. So kind of epic, you know, when you look back on those things and you're like, that didn't need to roll out like that. And these days that would never happen, but it did back then in the 90s. And then at the same time as cabin life is happening for you, there's ski racing. And are you able to spend as much time with the family at the cabin or are you on the road ski racing a lot? Like what does life look like for you when you're in high school? Yeah, once I got into high school, I got pretty serious about ski racing. So I was traveling a ton for that. So I wasn't up there as much. And it was also, you know, I definitely hit a phase where I was like a teenager and I was like, I don't want to go hang out with my family at my cabin right now. I want to hang out with my friends and do what my friends are doing. So there were a few years there where I think I missed out on a couple trips up there here and there. And I still loved it. I just had other interests at that time. For sure. You've got to have a life. Yeah, exactly. But ski racing took me away from it for a few years and then... Once I finished ski racing, I just realized how much I love the backcountry again and started making it a priority to get up there more. But with ski racing, it sounds like you're like a lot of people who've been on this podcast before. Like you were really, really fast. You took a lot of chances and you didn't finish a lot. And when I say you didn't finish a lot, like a lot, a lot from the results I saw. So does it get <laughs> frustrating to the point where it was laughable to you or did it get you in a bad mood? Because it just sounds like you were on the edge trying to push the gas too hard every race. And a lot of times it didn't pan out for you. Yeah, that was classic me. Just wanted to go as fast as I could. And I knew if I finished, I would do really well. And I, I just never had it in me to like hold back. I was like, it's all or nothing. It was really frustrating. It was really discouraging because, you know, I trained with these girls for years and, and people were moving up to the Alberta team and then the national team and stuff like that. And I was like, I know I can ski as fast as them. Like I train with them and I can finish a course in training. But yeah, I just really struggled with racing and it was just like a total mental game for me. And with racing though, it's not like you finish high school and go straight to college. It's so serious for you that you take a year off of high school and focus on ski racing. And is it something where you're like totally traveling the world and you feel like you have a real shot at making the World Cup and the Olympic team? Or is that just a pipe dream? It was a dream for sure. Like I think I held on really hard to that dream. And yeah, lots of girls that I went to high school with and raced with and trained with and we were skiing at the same level did make it that far. But for me, I, I think just like that mental block, it just wasn't going to work for me. But I was traveling the world and skiing in, in Norams and, you know, trying to finish races, going places to try and get points and stuff like that, but didn't work out. What was the most memorable race of your career? Do you have one that just stands out as like the best weekend or the best results or just the all around best experience with ski racing? Hmm, the best. I remember having some really, really great runs. I always raced really well at Panorama because we trained there so much. So yeah, I had a couple early season good results there that felt really good. And, you know, Probably the most memorable race for me was racing the, the Noram downhill in Lake Louise. For the first time, I was really excited. I think I had done well in a downhill in Panorama, but I got to Lake Louise and I was like, oh yeah, this is real. This is a lot different, the terrain and the course. And you're basically on a World Cup course and it's injected and steep and icy and there's girls from all over there. And I had a big crash and went into the nets and tore my MCL and it was kind of a sad end to an early season race. 
but I will never forget it. Okay. <laughs> it sticks with me. Like I watch that race. I watch the World Cup happen and it gives me goosebumps because I can just remember being there and how intimidating it was and exciting it was. Now it's time for my first sponsor break, and I'm going to start out with Elon Skis. And I'm in love with both my Ripstick 106 Black Edition and the 96 Black Edition. They are so fun and lively, all while remaining light and stable. And I'm not the only person who thinks these ski better than the competition. Both of these skis were named Editor's Picks in Free Skier Magazine tests. So the pros out there, the testers, everyone who's actually getting on these skis, they know they're the best skis. I'm telling you they're amazing too. You're going to feel the difference. Because great product is why Elan is building a cult following in the U.S. But what's really amazing about the brand is that they built a solar power plant on top of their state-of-the-art factory. And their independence from fossil fuels along with that new solar plant will provide a carbon sink as powerful as 15,000 trees on an annual basis. They are putting their money where their mouth is when it comes to the planet. So to find out about all things Elan, head on over to ElanSkis.com. Next up is Outdoor Research. They've been building award-winning outerwear and gear in Seattle since 1981. For 40 years, badasses in the mountains have trusted OR gear to be the best, and they still are. But when you head over to OutdoorResearch.com these days to see their new line of product, you're going to notice some major differences. While OR still makes that badass technical gear you've come to trust, they've branched out and hired new cutting-edge designers who have their fingers on the pulse to create new fits, cuts, styles, and colorways that are still functional, but now styled to look great at the resort, in the park, in the backcountry, at the bar, or even a night on the town. And there really is so much new stuff to check out from OR. It's not just outerwear. I'm stoked because everything looks so good that I'm about to have a full OR wardrobe. And if you want to do that, I'm going to help you make it happen by getting you 25% off all non-sale items. So go shopping at OutdoorResearch.com, and when you check out, enter the code POWELL25, that's all caps and numbers with no spaces, and you'll get the deal. Please note that you won't be able to use the code on OR Pro products. My next sponsor is Stanley, another iconic Seattle brand that has been ahead of the curve since 1913. While we all know Stanley for creating that iconic green bottle that kept your grandpa's coffee hot all day long, they still do that and a whole lot more these days and they have always been the right choice when it comes to the planet. If you are still using single-use plastics for your beverages, it's time to make a change for the environment and get yourself a Stanley water bottle for starters. I'm making it easier than ever to do so. You'll save 30% on all Stanley products when you head on over to Stanley1913.com, buy some stuff, and I highly recommend a water bottle and a set of their pint glasses, which I use every single day. And when you check out, Enter the code DRINKFAST, that's all one word, all lowercase, no spaces, so that's all one word, that's what that means, and you're done. Spend over 75 bucks, and you'll get a limited edition Powell Movement beanie. Those are my sponsors, now let's get back into the podcast. The next move for you when you quit racing is going to college. You go to the University of Calgary, and have you accepted that you're going to have a regular life at this point, like you're going to go to school, and then you're going to get a job like your dad did, but you still want to coach racing at Banff? Yeah. Same thing. I was like, okay, this is what you do after you finish high school and racing. You go to university and then you get a job. That's what I saw the people around me doing. So yeah, I was going to school and then I worked on the weekends as a coach in Banff, which was amazing because it kept me connected to the mountains and still in my ski boots every week, sliding around on snow. So yeah, I think that's what I thought my path was, but I still was like, how is this going to (laughs) work? Well, it sounds like the free ride kids are really what changes your path in life because you end up coaching free ride kids. You switch from the race program and they start encouraging you to compete in big mountain contests. And is that really where the switch with everything really happens for you is like the second you get into one of those contests and you realize that you're back at home again? Yeah, it was really going to coach the free ride team that changed everything for me. I loved coaching racing and the connection I had with all the racers but I just found there were so many days I was out there where I was just you know setting courses and screening gates and never even buckling up my boots to like go take a proper run and I was like I want to ski like I miss skiing so much so luckily there's this amazing free ride program at Lake Louise and I ended up getting a job coaching for them and after that first season I was like oh, this is it. This is where I've been meant to be this entire time. And yeah, I spent a couple of years taking the kids to free ride comps. And finally, they convinced me to 
enter one and I did. And I was like, oh yeah, this is pretty cool. It's an amazing community. You get to travel around to these different ski resorts and push yourself in a way that I hadn't done since I had quit ski racing. So it was great. Who are the people that you're competing against and how do you do in those events? So I'll never forget my first one. Leah Evans was there, Sarah Frude, lots of girls that I still ski with today, Tessa Treadway. And I remember, honestly, very similar to ski racing, picking a line, ready to go for it. No fear, send it, huge blowouts, pretty much every time. But it seems like soon after that, and I don't know how soon after that, you land Rozzy as a sponsor. And how does that whole thing come together? I had a couple decent results in some comps. I think the big thing was I finished school, I finished university, and I moved to Revelstoke. Well, I actually didn't even finish. I had like a couple courses left and I was like, I'm out of here. Revelstoke, the ski hill had just expanded from a one chairlift, you know, tiny hill to this amazing resort. I had some friends from high school that had moved out here and they were living the life skiing powder and spending their time in the mountains. So I moved out to Revelstoke and I was competing a little bit. I was still coaching back in Lake Louise. So I was driving to Lake Louise every weekend from Revy and I was skiing every single day. Like I was obsessed. It was the best. It snowed so much. This place was so cool. There was tons to explore. And because the resort had just done this massive expansion and it was really becoming a spot on the map for like free ride skiing, big mountain skiing, backcountry skiing, tons of media was showing up in town. And as one of the newly local girls that was out there every day, I started getting asked to go out and ski with photographers and writers and stuff like that, which just kind of snowballed into this ski career. So it all starts out with just someone in Revy noticing your talent and saying, hey, we've got people coming in town to shoot photos. We want you to shoot with them. And then from there, that's how Rosie and everything evolves for you. Exactly. Yeah. There was a photographer in town. They wanted to shoot with some female skiers and males. Like they wanted to get a group together. And they were like, who are the local shredders? And when I moved to town, I knew Chris Rubens. He had moved here a couple years prior. And I knew him from ski racing and we high school. And then also Sean Cochran had also just moved to town. And we had been buddies from ski racing. And Christina Lustenberger, actually. And we were out skiing a ton together and exploring and like, finding all the cliffs we could at the resort and new lines and then exploring the backcountry and going sled skiing. And I don't know, people were starting to notice us as just people that were out there skiing all the time. And so when, yeah, a photographer came to town, we were asked to go shoot with them. Sounds like an all-time crew right there. That's happening way back then. You get noticed. Speaking of getting noticed, back then when you're in Revy or anywhere you go, because you travel to a ton of places and there are dudes everywhere you go, I would think. It's like 90% dudes everywhere you go. When you go ski resort to ski resort, do you have to constantly deal with being hit on by dudes at bars? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, for sure. Yeah. (laughs) There's just dudes, dudes everywhere. Either there, you know, there's a lot of, I don't know. I don't know. I would think it's different if you go out in Calgary where there's like a lot of women and there's a regular ratio compared to when you go to a ski resort where there's nine dudes for every woman out there. Yeah, you're definitely a lot of like being the token girl out on the ski day or on the chairlift or on the trip. But actually, let me backtrack a bit because one of the most amazing things about Revelstoke that I have always loved is from the get-go, there has been this amazing crew of female skiers here. Lucy and I moved to town the same year. And so we skied a ton together those first couple years. And she's obviously like so incredible. And then Sean Cochran's partner, she is an amazing skier and there are all these female guides that I was starting to meet in town and so there's just this amazing like deep field of female athletes and skiers and and just people passionate about the mountains here so I do feel like I've always had a pretty solid crew but yes that being said in the ski world it's definitely very male dominated how about skiing with dudes Is it funny to see a guy's reaction when they realize that you're a better skier than they are? Like you could be at the bar with them the night before drinking beers and they're all like confident or cocky or whatever. But then the next day when they're on the snow and they see how good you ski, it's like a holy shit moment for them. Yeah, it can be funny. I think it's changed a bit because it's more, I don't know. There are just so many amazing female skiers. So people 
are more aware and accepting of like girls that can shred now. But yes, I do remember going on a ski date like back in the day. It was actually at like Louise. I had met this guy in the city and we went skiing together and I think he was really intimidated by me and I don't think he had a very good time. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was less impressed and it was like a big shot to his ego. We didn't end up hanging out again. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever experienced blatant sexism in the mountains or in a mountain experience? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. There's a lot of that. And it's definitely been a place where women have had to work really, really hard to find their place and get acknowledged and get supported. Yeah, it's a huge issue, kind of like it is all across the board. For sure. Is there any one moment where you kind of look back and you're like, I can't believe he said that to me or I can't believe that happened? I do. Actually, I have this very memorable moment early on my first year in Revy, I'm not going to name names, but I remember meeting some friends to go ski touring in Rogers Pass. Well, it was, it was two friends and they're a couple and we met up at the coffee shop and we were planning our day. And then we had another friend come in who's a very talented mountain person, <laughs> skier, athlete. And we were kind of like, Oh, what's your plan for the day? And he looked at the other female and, and I and was like, oh, I think we have a bit different agendas for the day. We're going to the past, but yeah, maybe we'll see you up there. And huh. yeah, basically, I think like he would have been stoked to bring the guy along, but he was not interested in bringing the other girl and I along. And we were just like, okay, thanks, bud. And we ended up going up and summiting this mountain and having like a really epic day, which felt really good. <laughs> what a dick. Yeah. And then... Back when you were coming up, per se, brands didn't seem to have big teams of women, but the shift was kind of starting. How did you hook up with the North Face and Jiro back then? So once I got on with Rozzy, it was a bit of a snowball effect that kind of opened doors to more shooting with photographers because the way it works a lot of the time is a photographer has a retainer or a contract with a company, so then they'll want to shoot with their athletes. So I started shooting with some photographers in Whistler, like I shot with Eric Berger quite a bit in Whistler because he was associated with Rosignol and we had a great relationship and worked super well together. And then, yeah, once you have good photos, you can kind of take those to other companies and say, this is me, this is what I can do. And these are all the other things I'm doing in the industry that will help you get exposure for your brand and stuff like that. And, and for me, I'd say my influence has always been really multifaceted. Like I've coached and I've written articles for magazines and I've shot photos and I filmed and I've tried to just expand my skill set as much as I can. I've never been like a one trick pony or just totally just focusing on filming or focusing on one thing. So I was able to kind of take this resume of accomplishments to the North Face and they signed me. And then with Jiro, that was a really great experience for me because there was a trip happening to Retallic. It was their like catalog shoot for the year. And Dave Treadway was going and Ingrid Backstrom was supposed to go, but I think she injured herself or something happened and she couldn't make it. And so they were trying to find another female and Dave put my name forward, which was awesome because I skied with him and Tessa quite a bit. So they brought me on the trip. And then at the end of the trip, they offered me a contract. That's amazing. So it's all about yeah. who you know and who you're friends with and how they can connect you in a lot of ways once you've gotten to a certain level, it seems like. It really is. Like, it's very much a community. And yeah, just having those introductions is super helpful. And the perks of being a, a sponsored athlete are the trips, I would think. I mean, there's money and other things, too. But what was the first big sponsor trip you went on other than Retallic? Like, what was your first big trip where you're in helicopters? Well, my first day of heli skiing was actually here in Revelstoke, and it was filming with this super local crew. So the same photographer that I first went out shooting with decided to make this film <laughs> and like... You're laughing. It's so long ago. It's, oh my God, I would love to go back and rewatch that. Like, it's probably pretty hilarious, but it was called Rev. And it was just the story of Revelstoke and the skiers that live here. And it was like this uber local, super small production, but with a crew of really awesome skiers like Christine Lustenberger, Sean Cochran, Greg Hill, Chris Rubens. Yeah, a bunch of other locals. Guy Mowbray, I think was in it. Maybe. I don't know. So I ended up getting invited to go out and film with those guys heli skiing one day locally here with Selkirk Tangiers. And that was really cool. 
And then first big international trip was Japan with Robin O'Neill, a photographer. And then I was there with her. And then it led into a Jiro trip. You did do a Jiro trip to Alaska for a week. I did. And that one was another, I don't know if it was a one day of heli skiing, but it sounded like the first five days of you being in Alaska, you were pretty much socked in and it was just down days. Yeah, a lot of down days. Classic Alaska, you're just waiting for your weather window. I think we had a couple days out, two days out maybe in the heli. That was my big trip to Alaska. I actually haven't been back since then, but yeah, that was a big, amazing experience. You end up going there with a reality show star. Colston Vibe, I think, was on that trip. He was. I've interviewed yeah. him before uh, for a podcast, but you're on that trip and it sounds like you guys are socked in for the first five or so days. And then does like a window of weather just kind of open up where there's a godlike moment. You can see the mountains and it's just like go time and everybody get their shit and go. Yeah, exactly. You're kind of on edge waiting for it and waiting for that window. And then suddenly it hits and boom, you're out the door. You're in a helicopter flying over these crazy broken glaciers up these steep bridges, getting dropped off on the top of knife edge ridges with cornices on them. And they're like, okay, drop in, ski the steepest, most blind roll of your life into this wild run. Have fun. <laughs> Are there any warm up runs or is it pretty much like it's clear, let's go, we're going to get this on film? Yeah, like sometimes there are warm up runs, but. Not always. Sometimes it's like you have a window, conditions are good. If you don't go hit the line that you want to hit, someone else is going to go get it because we were up there in the spring and it's when all the film crews are up there flying around. And so there's a bit of a battle for zones and lines and stuff like that. So yeah, you, you have to take it when you can get it. And it was really challenging for me just being my first trip in Alaska. The terrain is so wild. It's so wild. It's super intimidating. It's super real. And I was like, I need warm up runs. <laughs> I need to ease into this a bit. But there was no opportunity for that. So we just threw ourselves into it and went. And yeah, luckily, the crew is pretty sweet. It was Colston and Riley LeBeau. Riley had been up there before. And he was really, really helpful in helping me choose lines and just have the confidence to drop into them. And when you say you guys are jockeying for almost position with other groups, because there's so many groups out there. Do you find that since you guys might not be as big a names as the TGR bird or the MSP crew, that you don't get into the terrain that you want because everybody's jockeying? Or is it kind of like first come, first serve? Yeah, it's kind of first come, first serve. And at that time, I remember our guide was kind of advocating for us. So you make a plan with them and then they go to bat for you and flagging those specific runs that you want to ski. But yeah, I'm sure like if there are big crews up there spending a lot of money, spending a lot of time there ones that really know the train and know where they want to go, they're for sure going to get priority. And when you're in it, when you get dropped off on top of that gnarly line, I'm sure there's some fear, nervous energy, total focus, doubt, uncertainty. Like what's going through your head as you're looking down? I mean, you might not even be able to look down because there's those blind rollovers, but what's going through your head at the top of those no fall zones? I just had this mantra of commit, commit, because you don't want to drop in and hesitate in Alaska. You need to be committed to your line, know where you want to go, ski it fast, get strong. So yeah, it's a lot of just like, okay, let's do this, being really focused. There was a lot of fear for me. Like, I do remember, I really wanted to get out there. I was, I was frothing to get out there. But at the same time, every day that we didn't fly, I was like breathing a bit of a sigh of a relief. They'd be like, okay, it's too foggy for us to get up there. I'd get up all stoked and like getting my head in the game and like trying to get ready. And then as soon as they would say, we're not going, I was like, my whole body would just relax and I'd <laughs> probably just melt into a puddle on the floor. Like, okay, I need to rest so that I can do this again tomorrow. I guess it's great to have mentors like Riley up there, or at least acting as a mentor because he's been there before and giving you some information because... What you do, there isn't that much information. I mean, there is a lot of uncertainty. When you think about being a pro skier, there's no blueprint of how to do it. There's no blueprint of how you talk to your sponsors and how you get a good contract. Did you have anybody in the ski world that was helping you out with stuff? Or was it pretty much you on your own trying to carve your own path through it? I've definitely had a lot of people helping me out. You know, as athletes, we support each other. I feel like, especially as women, I have some really good friends. You know, like Leah Evans, she started Girls Do Ski way, way, way back, way long ago. And I've coached with her from the beginning. I haven't the past few years, but we always were kind of like 
trying to help each other out, at least talk about what's going on and how to get sponsored. But when it comes down to specifics, like how much people are getting paid or what to ask your sponsors for, no one really talks about it. And it's hard. It's hard because you just never really know what your value is or how to compare yourself to other athletes. One thing I really understood early on, because I took marketing in school, and so I always had this strong awareness of, you know, the ROI, like, what am I bringing to the table for the sponsor? And what am I getting in return? And I think once athletes understand that, you're not just getting sponsored because you're cool, or you can like, throw a double backflip, like it has to be the full package. Your job as an athlete is to get brand exposure for the brand. That's why the money they're paying you is coming out of their marketing budget. So you're a marketing tool for them. So I always had a pretty good grasp of that early on. And I always tried to like show my value through that. It's time for my second sponsor break. And Peter Glenn Ski and Sports has been getting people out into the mountains since 1960. And before the internet took off, Peter Glenn prided themselves on being the best in retail, offering the most knowledge and the best service. They still have that. But not everyone can get to one of their retail locations. But there's always the internet. And the Peter Glenn shopping experience is what you want from a website. Smooth, easy to navigate, and full of information. And PeterGlenn.com has all the brands, all the products, and they always have a deal going on. If that's not enough, they offer free shipping on orders of $49 or more, a no-hassle return policy, and they price match any reputable shop on the web. So please support the brand that supports me. And check out Peter Glenn Ski and Sports before you buy from someone else. Last but not least is the Ten Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. They have been brewing my favorite Northwest beer since 2006. And since they started brewing beer, they've been supporting the sports we love. If you aren't sure about what they've done in action sports, I'll tell you. They're the first beer brand to produce their own ski and snowboard movie. They support a team of A-list athletes, and they have signature beers that donate to causes like Protect Our Winners, and they're part of some of the most important events and properties in action sports. So, they've done a lot, and the next time you're at the store, pick up a six-pack of Ten Barrel and support the beer that supports action sports. To find out more about the beers, the pubs, and events, head on over to TenBarrel.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. The key for your job is generating exposure and hopefully that exposure is going to sell product. For you, you're going to generate your exposure through film, but it's not going to be through ski porn. It's not going to be your MSPs and TGRs. It's going to be with the Sherpas. And first, how do you connect with those dudes? Yeah, the Sherpas, well, they're a Calgary connection. So they grew up in Calgary. They were Fortress guys too, right? They were Fortress guys too. They're a couple years older than me, so I never skied with them when I was younger. But when they dropped their first film, The Fine Line, which was their first avalanche education film. Yeah, I remember going to the premiere in Calgary and meeting them and connecting with them. And then the ski world's just small. You end up reconnecting with these people over and over again. And yeah, I ended up on a couple film trips with them when they were filming Into the Mind. And I really connected with them like as humans. I think they're such incredible people. I loved how creative their films were. I really was in awe of what they were producing. And I actually, when they put out All I Can, their second big film, feature film, I connected with them and I hosted some premieres for them Okay. in the interior. And so I was connected with Malcolm, the main producer. And then through that, yeah, I think I ended up going on a couple trips and filming and it was really amazing. And then it actually led into more work with them, like producing the film tour for Into the Mind. So I ended up working with them both on and off screen quite a bit. And it's like something that you've done throughout your whole career is that you've always had the business side as well. You did some stuff with Micah Creek running sales and marketing, but you're also skiing as well or a sponsored skier. So you've always got your, your hooks in different things where, yeah, you're going to film with the Sherpas, but you're also going to be managing their tour as well. So there's a lot of different aspects of what you're doing. But when I think about the Sherpas, I think about it like art. They weren't building ski heroes like Matt Stick or TGR. They were building art pieces. And did it feel like you were working with creative geniuses or was it more they got the shots in the field and they did all their magic in post? Oh, no, it felt like I was working with creative geniuses, like ski bro creative geniuses. <laughs> like those guys love skiing so much, which obviously is what led them into the line of work that they are in. And so they're always seeking powder and adventure and, and good skiing. 
but approaching it in such a creative way, always looking for cool shots, cool ways to film, like their early kind of cable cam shots and stuff are pretty hilarious. And then post too, like when I worked with them as the tour manager for Into the Mind, I was in the office in Whistler for quite a while. And just seeing the editing process for that was really eye-opening. They work so hard and they're so creative and so driven to create things that are unique and have never been seen before. Another person associated with that crew, who's arguably one of the most important skiers of our time, I don't talk about him enough, I don't know why, but did you get to work with JP at all? I did. JP was also in the office when I was there because he edited his own segments. Yeah, so we hung out a lot and I never filmed with JP. I skied with him a little bit. We like went on a couple after work bike rides and runs together in Whistler and he was a really incredible, very amazing human. Yeah, he definitely was and a huge yeah. loss. And when you think about the, the highlights of your time with the Sherpas, what are they? I'd say just the whole Into the Mind filming experience was really cool. I had an epic trip with them, cat skiing at Selkirk Wilderness Skiing near Meadow Creek. It dumped. We were there for seven days. We skied so hard. We got tons of good shots. It was really, really fun. I loved that trip. And then, yeah, being in the office with them was really cool. It really opened my eyes to film production. I've always been really driven to find like a creative path, I think, and it made me want to dive further into film production, like the producer side of things. I think I've always been good at organizing things. I don't think I really have what it takes to be like an editor or a filmer, but the producing and helping develop creative concepts and like bringing all the puzzle pieces together is kind of where my skill set lies. I've used that in pretty much every job outside of skiing, well, even skiing that I've had. And so, yeah, it made me realize, wow, this film production thing, it's really neat. And so I pursued it a little bit and I've produced three film projects of my own. And I've also done some more film production work with the Sherpas in recent years as well. Was it a bummer that they didn't come out with another feature? Because it seemed like you were in position to be in their next movie if they had another feature ski movie. But that next season, that didn't happen. Was that a bummer to you? Yeah, it was. Like I would jump on any chance to go filming with them for sure, especially at that time. Okay. And then on top of that, it seems like around that time you end up losing Rosie as a sponsor or something happens there where you're not on Rosie anymore. What happens there? I was just, I, well, I, I kind of had gained a little bit more confidence in my position in the industry and my level of influence, I guess you could say. So I went to Rosie and I was asking them for, you know, more. And yeah, they weren't really interested at that time. And so, or they didn't have it in their budget. And so I had an opportunity to move to Solomon. So I swapped over to Solomon for a couple of years and that was great, but kind of less, I don't know. I just felt like as a female, there wasn't as much support there as I would have liked, which led me to Atomic where I am today. And you also switched from the North Face to Arcteryx back then. What was the reasoning there? That opportunity came to me through that time I spent in Whistler working with the Sherpas I met some of the marketing team for Arcteryx and we just connected and kind of realized that our values really aligned on, you know, what they were doing with their brand. And I really liked that they were a Canadian brand and based in Vancouver. And I, I really appreciated a lot of what they were doing. Their gear is so amazing. And so, yeah, we worked out a deal and I joined Arcteryx. So at this point in time, you know, you've got paying sponsors and you've got travel budgets, I'm sure. Do you have to work or is the skiing paying the bills for you? No, I've always had to work. Yeah, it's never been enough to pay the bills completely. And sometimes I wonder, you know, if I had fully, like fully committed to it and just let go of work and dove in completely, would I have found a way to make it, you know, a full-time gig? But I've always had other jobs. And I think that's partially because I am driven in other ways. Like I really like the creative aspect of the jobs that I've had and the meaning that have been behind a lot of them. And then just like that they challenge me in ways that aren't physical, I guess. So yeah, no, it's never fully paid the bills. But yeah, travel budget, it's always been a nice little side gig. And like I said, you've always had a lot of different things going on. So there are ways to pay the bills. And you're also able to be a pro skier. 
But the next big life event I'm going to bring up is you get married and have a kid. And first and foremost, when you're pregnant, what are the thoughts? Do you think your ski career is over and a new chapter is starting or are you determined to do both or what's going through your head? I had no idea, honestly. It felt like the future was very foggy and I always knew I wanted to have a family. So it was something that I was, you know, committed to pursuing and excited about, but I didn't really have like an example to follow, like any female skiers that had had babies and continued doing it. There are definitely some out there, but no one that I was close to. At that time, Ingrid had had a baby about a year earlier, and I called her right away. And I was just like, how did you tell your sponsors you were pregnant? Like, what did you tell them? I'm so scared to tell them. I just don't know what's going to happen. And she told me that her experience with telling her sponsors was really positive, And she felt the same way, you know, like, I think she said she waited quite a while to tell her sponsors. And I was on my way to an Arcteric sales meeting. And I knew like those weeks are usually, you know, there's lots of like team dinners and stuff. And so people are having drinks. And I was like, I'm not going to get away with not, I'm going to have to tell them. Yep. They're going to find out. So yeah, she just gave me a lot of confidence and yeah, breaking the news. And I did, and it was received super well. You know, obviously everyone was happy and they committed to continuing to support me. That's awesome. And then I'm going to fast forward to a movie that you made a few years back with Tessa Treadway, Motherload, and it's about single moms. And it's based around you and Tessa. Tessa's husband was taken from her in the mountains, and you mentioned getting divorced. But that's it. There's no other context. And it's almost like this guy's been scrubbed from your digital history. And I was able to find out all about him because I'm really good at research, but I'm not going to go into detail about him because that's not what this is about. But was this whole breakup or this whole ending of your marriage, was it not a clean and easy split? You are good at research. Thank you. Yeah, no, the dissolving of my marriage was super challenging. It wasn't a clean and easy split at all. I mean, I don't think it ever is, especially when there are kids involved. I think it appeared to the outside world that it was very sudden and unexpected, but internally it wasn't. There were a lot of struggles. No one knows what's going on behind someone's closed door. So while it looks like one thing, no one knows. Totally. And especially like social media, we think we know people in their inner lives, but we really don't. Right. And yeah. And like as much as I post my life on Instagram and stuff like that, I am still quite a private person about certain things. So yeah, people that were close to me were not overly surprised. That's for sure. It was a long kind of challenging road to the final decision of going our separate ways. And you know, we've had some struggles for a long time. And then I think having a baby, as much as people think it fixes everything. No, it makes it crazy. <laughs> yeah, it just makes things more challenging. You're just more you, like your energy, emotional and physical are going into this little human. And for me, it wasn't like having the same amount of energy to support my relationship anymore. And when you have a kid with someone for better or worse, when you know, if you stay together, or you get divorced, whatever you have that connection with someone for life almost. I mean, do you still have to deal with your ex? Yeah. <laughs> Does that suck? You know what? Right now it's really good. That's awesome. It has sucked. It had a couple years of really sucking and being really challenging, but we're in a good place right now. Yeah, he's around. He's super involved with my son's life, which is really good. You know, and I've always just taken the approach and had the mindset of I need to stay connected to him for Knox. And like, it's important for Knox to have a relationship with his dad and everything. And it is, they love each other. And he's a huge influence in his life. That's awesome that you've been able yes. to, to figure a way to do that correctly for your kid. Cause that's, that's awesome. And really I'm no single dad. I have a great wife, but she's compromised right now. So I kind of feel like a single dad. And the only thing that really bothers me about that is that life never ends between like, Laundry, getting stuff ready for school, daycare, this, that. It's just there, there's always something going on. And that's just life right now. You live like that 24-7 because that's your life. Does it feel like you're always on the go with no help? It did for a bit. But I luckily met an amazing guy a couple years ago. <laughs> and he kind of just like quickly integrated into our lives as a partner so I have an amazing partner and we actually have another baby now. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'm definitely not on my own. He's actually taking a paternity leave at the moment. But yeah, as a parent, it's way harder when you're single. Parenting is definitely a two-person job. It makes it so much easier 
but it's still hard when I mean, there's two of you. It still like consumes so much of your time and energy. And then when you have kids, does it also give you an aha moment about your carbon footprint? Like you have to think about the world that you're going to leave for an ox when he's older. Is that kind of how the whole protect our winners things happen? Or how do you get into protect our winners? Because I'm going to try to transition it and it didn't really go that slick. Having kids definitely makes you look at the world in a totally different way. And for me, that was really examining, you know, my impact on the earth and carbon footprint and kind of what world I'm leaving for my kids. And I was in a place in my career outside of skiing where I was really looking for some more like meaning in what I was doing. And I was connected to Dave Erb, who was the executive director of Protect Our Winters Canada through a fellow Arcteryx athlete, Greg Hill, and he was working very closely with Dave and they were looking for someone to coordinate their programs and their education program and the athletes and stuff like that. And Dave and I started talking and he kind of described more about the organization. I had heard about it and followed POW in the US for quite a while, but I didn't have a super in-depth knowledge of what it was all about. And yeah, Dave just really really sold me on it. I was like, wow, this is super amazing and super important. And it's something I want to be a part of. So you're with Protect Our Winners. And Dave had many amazing things to say about your time there. I'm not going to go through them all because we're getting towards the end of the podcast. But you created the ambassador program up in Canada. And being that you're an athlete yourself, does it make it easier for you to get athletes to do things being that you've lived their lives? (laughs) I think it gave me a a stronger understanding of what I was up against in getting athletes to do things Okay, (laughs) (laughs) and just like getting them to respond to emails and stuff. No, just kidding. But no, some of them are bad at it. That's very true. Yeah, it gave me a good understanding of what like working with an athlete is all about and kind of what they will engage with and what they won't. And so that was really good because I was able to take that knowledge and bring it to our campaign conversations and you know, we had team meetings every week and we would talk about the campaigns we were working on nonstop. And it always came down to, okay, how are we going to get this out to our audience? And we, our athletes are like our main messengers at POW. So I would help kind of formulate a strategy to first sell the athletes on the campaign. Like this is important because, and you should feel connected to this because, and then we need you. And then if they felt connected to the campaign and felt it was important to them, then they were way more inspired to use their voices and help spread the word. Right. You take leave at POW to have another child. And I don't know how the maternity leave works in Canada, but it seems like when it's time for you to come back to POW, you end up opening a flower shop. What happens there? (laughs) random yeah yeah so that was a very random event in canada we get a 12 to 18 month maternity leave what super lucky yeah dude we got we got a four-day weekend in the u.s i know it's crazy we're super lucky and so you can split the leave with your partner if you want so my partner and i decided that i would take a year and he would take the remainder of the 18 month mat leave. And so I took a little bit over a year. I think I was going on 13 months and I was about to come back to work. And honestly, my mat leave was so amazing. One thing I was really, really reveling in was just how nice it was not being on my computer all the time. And COVID, you know, it shifted the way we all work so much. And I had spent the two years prior, just like 40 hours a week, on my screen and not connecting with people in person at all and just Zoom calls nonstop. And it was challenging for me, especially someone who, I mean, at my core, like I'm an athlete, I'm an outdoorsy person. I like to move. I'm creative, you know, and it started to just make me think about a potential shift into something where I could be less on the computer and more working with people in the community and also something just like more creative where I'm working with my hands. But I really, I honestly couldn't come up with anything I thought about. I'm like, I think I'm just going to go work on a farm. (laughs) Like, I just want physical labor. I want to be outside. But yeah, I couldn't find the thing I was looking for. And then in the month or two prior to going back to work, this opportunity came up in town to buy the flower shop. And it's two blocks away from my house. It's attached to a jewelry store that is owned by one of my best friends. And... 
I don't know what hit me. I saw the post on Facebook that the business was for sale and it must have just hit me in the right moment because I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. It's like you're your dad with his backcountry lodge. Totally, totally. And actually, the very ironic thing about this is my dad just sold the backcountry lodge this summer. Okay. So he's sold his share. He's moving on. And my dad was very generous. His four kids, he said, you guys put a lot of work into this over the years, so I'm going to share some of the sale profit. So he passed on a little chunk of money to each of us and modest, but I was like, okay, I'm going to use this for an investment in my future. And I was trying to figure out what to do with it. And then the flower shop thing came up. So I was like, okay, I can do this. So yeah, very much a leap of faith. Like my dad also very much supported by my dad and that experience with the Misqui, which is kind of cool. Yeah, it's a really cool full circle kind of story right there. And it's yeah. going to bring us to the end of the podcast in a segment of the show that I call Inappropriate Questions. And with this thing, I get someone that you know to ask three questions, and they can be anything. I was able to come up with a person that you've been on many a trip with, another badass pro skier. Leah Evans came up with the questions, and two of them are really good. And are you ready for the first and the easiest question from Leah? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> here we go. Hey, Leah Evans here. I just have some questions for my... Dear friend, Izzy Lynch, and my first question is, you're one of the fastest skiers that I know. You like to go straight and fast, and I want to know what inspired the skiing style for you. I think just having a background in ski racing, I've always really loved that feeling of just going super fast and trying to get top to bottom as fast as I can. Also, I want to keep up. I don't want to get left behind. So pushing myself to be with the fastest skiers is something I've always done. All right. And I guess we do have to make it inappropriate a little bit. And I'm going to try with this one. I'm probably not going to do a good job. But I guess we haven't really talked about anything else that you do other than skiing, really. Are there other sports that you're really good at that you just are better than all your friends at? I've been running quite a bit in the last couple of years. And yuck. yeah, I'd say I've did <laughs> yuck, exactly. I'd say I'm better than most of my friends at running. All right, we're going to go with our second inappropriate question. I just want to know how many times have you been confused for your sister, Zoya? Oh, gosh, multiple times a week, I would say. People in the grocery store in Revelstoke will just say, hey, Zoya, and I just respond now because it happens so often and it's not worth the awkwardness of correcting them. Have you ever used it to your advantage? Has there ever been any benefits to impersonating your sister? Well, I definitely say Zoya is like quite a bit cooler than me. So yeah, it gives me a bit of street cred if someone thinks I'm Zoya Lynch. My favorite thing is when people meet both of us and then they ask who's older. That's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Who is older? We are six years apart. I'm six years older than her. Oh, Jesus. Okay. And so when people ask if she's older, I'm like, yeah, thank you. All right, we're going to go with your final inappropriate question. How many times did you get your Toyota Yaris stuck in snow on your driveway? I'm just curious. And what, what was your solution for getting unstuck? First, no pro skier drives a Toyota Yaris, but you <laughs> did. First, I consider myself an environmentalist. So part of that is having a car with good gas mileage. So that's my answer to that. Okay. The Yaris got stuck quite a bit. No one in Revelstoke drives a Yaris. That is something I will say. And I used to live up on this hill that was like in town, but kind of out of town. It was like a dirt road. And then our driveway had a slight incline. And I got stuck tons. It's funny. I was actually talking about this last night with some friends, but... There were quite a few instances of me having to park my car at the bottom of the hill and then walk home like 700 or 800 meters. And then I had the car when I had Knox. And so I do have very vivid memories of loading my baby into his car seat and then getting in the car and it had snowed. And I'm like trying to get him to my mom's or something so that I can go skiing <laughs> in a rush, obviously, so I don't have time to snow blow the entire giant driveway. And my solution was often just pinning it. <laughs> my nickname is Rami. <laughs> I'm not the most graceful person. I like to just like get things done. My sister likes to call me Rami. So yeah, I would just get in there and like 
ram it back as fast as I could. And then often I would have to take like multiple runs at it and just go back and forth, back and forth, <laughs> which was really funny with the baby in the back. But yeah, the baby in the back thing kind of like, I, uh, there was a bit of an aha moment where I was like, maybe this isn't the right car for me anymore. <laughs> it's cool you're saving on uh, gas mileage and saving the earth. But yeah, maybe you need something a little bit more functional in the snow. Exactly. All right. Well, that's inappropriate questions. And that's our podcast. And your story from start to finish is really interesting. The whole juxtaposition of you being a ski racer that grew up in a backcountry lodge and then racing, not working out, but jumping right into the big mountain scene and carving out a career for yourself there. It's really, really neat how you're able to do that. And there are a lot of pro skiers that aren't going to get rich and famous in the pro ski world, but they're going to have a pro career that'll create amazing experiences and still allows for a regular life. And you have that. I mean, you've done both things. You've got a partner and kids and a life and you're a pro skier and you've traveled the world and you've done so much shit, but you haven't had to be just a pro skier and given up everything else. So I think it's a really cool part of your story. And I thank you for your time. Awesome. Wow. Great job. Great researching. Holy. Thank you so much. So that was time with Izzy Lynch. And while I wanted to get you more bad relationship details, I realized that that's not my job and I stayed away from that. While getting personal is important, and I do that a lot, I don't need to dive into what has to be one of the most emotional times in a person's life when it comes to their relationship. So while I stayed away here, don't worry. Relationships are one of the few things that I won't pry into. I hope you respect that. And looking at Izzy's career, she really wasn't that A-list skier that could focus 100% on skiing. She always had to do other things to make ends meet. And that's the case for most athletes in the ski world, because there just isn't that much money to pay people as everyone thinks there is. So it's really cool that Izzy was able to leverage her skiing as a vehicle to travel the world and have amazing experiences, all while she was figuring out what to do within her life. That's the podcast. At this point, I'll ask you to please review me on iTunes or post something about the podcast on social media. If I read what you wrote on the show, I'll give you one of these super limited custom multicam hats that I had made. I'm going to be really picky about giving these hats away, so you have to write something good on social media or in your review to get one of them. So if I read that review on my show, email me with your address at mike at the and I'll send you that hat. If anyone else has any questions or concerns or people they want me to interview on the podcast, you can email me at that same address and I will get back to you. Finally, please support the brands that make this show happen. They are Elon Skis, Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Outdoor Research, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Have a great week, everyone.